Good afternoon and welcome everybody. My name is Shira Gans and I'm from the New York City Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment. Welcome to a New York Music Month webinar. So excited to have you here. The Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment is the city agency that supports all the creative sectors in New York City and I'm the person who does all the programming to support our music industry, including creating and curating New York Music Month. So what's more iconic to New York than Broadway? I don't know, it kind of says it all. So pretty excited to have our partners at the Recording Academy of the New York chapter, who've been a long supporter of our office and a great producer of content for New York Music Month to have a star-studded panel today to discuss how they make a cast album for Broadway. We have plenty of other free events happening all month. You can check it out on the website that we'll put in the chat. We have free rehearsal space for artists. So please join us for more Music Month programming. And without further ado, let's learn about how to make a cast album. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. I'm Sean Flavin. I'm a Chief Theatricals Executive for Concord. Um, and an album producer and show producer. And we're joined today by uh, a number of fantastic uh, colleagues and friends uh, who are actively engaged in making cast albums uh, and uh, looking forward to having a discussion about that, about that unique process and uh, taking your questions at the end. Um, so uh, first we have uh, Scott Farthing, who is uh, EVP with uh, uh, Sony Masterworks Broadway. He runs uh, the label and marketing for that and uh, a and um, We have uh, Tom Kitt, who is a, a multi-award winning composer, lyricist, arranger, music supervisor, producer. Um, we have uh, Kelly O'Hara, who is a, also a multi-award winning uh, Broadway star and uh, recording artist. Um, we have Ian Kagey, who is a Grammy-winning uh, recording and editing and mixing engineer and producer. And we have Oscar Zambrano, who is a Grammy-winning uh, mastering engineer. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, so uh, for those who've, who are curious or read the preamble, uh, you know, uh, many of us are have started our our uh, fandom before our careers uh, listening to Broadway cast albums where we grew up. Um, I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. Um, I've lived in New York for almost 30 years, but and I've always wanted to do something like this. But it was listening to those albums at home that made me want to go see local productions and tours um, and eventually become a, a musician. Um, and what's uh, unique about this is that, um, at least for Broadway, these are albums that are made in New York. They're, they engage uh, hundreds of uh, singers, musicians, engineers, uh, composers, lyricists, orchestrators, um, music copyists. Um, and, uh, and so it's a business that is um, unique to this area, although there are al other albums made in other places, of course. Um, but since we're sponsored by the mayor's office, we want to talk about that, uh, keeping people employed in New York City, keeping studios open in New York City, which is a big, important part of that piece. Um, and the other thing that's that's unique about what we do is that these albums are almost always recorded in about two days. Um, it's very different than the process that you have with uh, uh albums and other genres and uh, solo albums and, and other studio albums. Um, and uh, Twas Ever Thus. Um, there are very few albums that I've worked on that were that took longer than that. Um, and uh, in, in the olden days, they used to record them often the day after opening um, on Broadway. I did that once. That is terrible for everyone involved. <laughs> Um, also, I've recorded an album the day after the Tony Awards, also to be avoided. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, the, the reason for the, the recording in such a short time is cost. Um, the, uh, the, the way that these albums are, the, the, the way that they're budgeted, the way they're paid for, we'll talk about um, is on two different scales for musicians and actors. Um, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, 
you know, very few of us who are involved in have anything to say about, but we've inherited these things. And uh, obviously that's a lot of pressure on everybody. It requires a lot of preparation and a lot of focus on those days and a lot of work after the fact because you don't get to spread it out over a long period of time. Also for most albums, it involves uh, renting a studio and having engineers. This is not well, most often, at least for Broadway, it's something you can make on your laptop at home. Um, so <laughs> uh, let's start with uh, Scott. And so in your role at Sony, uh, how do you go about choosing what shows you want to record? Hi, Sean. Thank you for uh, having me in the mayor's office and the Recording Academy. I'm super proud to be in a member of the Recording Academy and to be on this uh, amazing panel with these fine colleagues and uh, friends of mine, most of whom I've made records with actually uh, on this thing. And so we've I been through this. I cleverly engineered it that way. I think you did. We've all been through this uh, crazy process. Um, just to add a quick bit of color there to what you were talking about there, Sean. Um, yeah, I'll, the the quick color story is uh, one of the many cast albums we did at Sony this year was uh, for the newly minted uh, best musical, The Outsiders. And uh, the crazy time period of that was um, I held a listening session with uh, the cast and with the orchestra who had recorded that album five weeks to the day after we recorded it and then put it out two days after that. So within five weeks of recording, that thing was done, mixed, mastered, got into Sony and up onto iTunes and Spotify and everything within five weeks. So that is the insanity of what you were talking about there, buddy. Um, well, that, that's a good point because it's also the, 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 the urgency to get it out as close to as soon as possible after the show opens. And exactly. All it's not just, yeah, it's not just the finances that make it, you know, that we go so quickly. It's also the fact that, you know, every day lost, you know, there've been more crowds that have gone in to see these shows on Broadway and we want to capitalize on that. We want to get these into fans' hands as quick as possible. And then, you know, obviously this is a collaboration with the show producers and these are a huge, you know, it's a big part of the marketing of these musicals is to get this music out there. I mean, it's a lot of money to ask for people to pay for tickets to see Broadway. And one of the most important things you can do is tell them what they're in for and give them a listen to it. And the album is usually that, you know, the biggest way to do, go about that. So that's also why we try to get them out as quick as we can. So um, as far as how we choose things, you know, it's Sony. Um, you know, it's 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 a it's a it's an ever evolving calculus of what we do and why we do it. Um, over the past, you know, dozen years that I've been working over here, um, you know, what's popular, what um, how things go. The business has changed dramatically. You know, when something like a Hamilton comes in there and then changes kind of the game of what is a cast album and and you know how valuable are cast albums and who wants to make cast albums and things of that nature. Um, so I would actually say, you know, one of the biggest things today, aside from obviously quality and know it, hoping that it's a great score and a wonderful team of musicians that are working on it, you know, one of the things I'm looking for right now, and this is, you know, it's, it's a crapshoot like many other things, but it's, you know, is this show going to have longevity? These, these albums, to your point, are um, very expensive to make and they take a long time to pay off. So, you know, in some respects, it's kind of gambling. Do I think the show is gonna have legs? Is it going to stay on Broadway for a while enough to, to maybe pay this thing off and to, to make some hay off that album? So that plays a huge part into it is like, you know, what's the, what's the landscape look like on Broadway right now? Is this gonna have its own kind of lane? Does this appeal across to multiple, you know, demographics worth of people? Um, but number, you know, as I say, first and foremost is really it's about the quality and it's about, you know, what's the quality of the songwriting. And my, my personal calculus is always this. If I'm going to see a show, whether it's a workshop or whether it's rehearsals or whatever, whatever else it is, is my first reaction. Do I want to listen to this music when I get out of this building? Um, and if it's like I want to listen to it right now, well, then there's your perfect answer right now, because I feel like, well, if I feel that way, other people are going to feel that way, too. So, you know, it's also just, you know, that gut instinct, too, which is, wow, this is really impactful. And, and I'm hoping that other people are going to feel that same way. Yeah, no, it's true. I think, um, you know, as, as I said, when we started, we want this is the things that drew us into this business. And so we want to make more of those things for other people to enjoy. Um, and. Uh, anything that we make, <clears throat> we have to listen to about 40,000 times as we're making, <laughs> recording, mixing, editing it. Um, uh, as my partner says, I know all the notes from listening through the door. So 
Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, in the back in the fifties, uh, you know, CBS Records was famous for having paid for, paid for not only the album but the production of My Fair Lady, which became one of the top selling albums ever, ever. And that was a long time ago. But mm -hmm. recently, your company and mine have both started also investing in shows. Um, sometimes to get the rights, sometimes to to get the recording rights, sometimes for other reasons. But mm -hmm. um, how are those decisions made when that happens? Uh, well, you know what, we make all sorts of deals here, you know, it's it's kind of, you know, what what does the show require? What are things like that? But yes, I would say um, many times part and parcel comes with that might be an investment in the show itself. Um, you know, look, a lot of our philosophy here is that, you know, these albums are not, you know, they're the tail of a dog. They're not the dog itself. And, you know, our feeling a lot of the times is, hey, if we're going to make this kind of, a, you know, investment in um, the music and the album, we're willing to also put some skin in the game in the show. And we kind of feel the same way then with um, the show producers themselves is like, well, we really should be kind of doing this together. And so that's usually how we try to do it. It's like any good partnership where it's like it's, you know, we both have skin in each other's game, even though it's a collective game in this particular case. But um, in many instances, yes, you know, these these musicals are very expensive to make these days. Um, you know, multi-million dollar budgets. And um, I can appreciate that, you know, there are costs that go along with that and, and need to be made for rights for certain things for albums as well. So, so yes, that is um, certainly a, a part of some of the calculus of those deals that we make. Yeah. And I think it's worth saying that there are different, there are a number of different kinds of deals that can be made with a label for the album where sometimes the show producers want to pay for everything mm -hmm. themselves and own the master and we distribute it. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, Tom, in, you wear a lot of hats uh, as a composer and arranger and music supervisor and other things. Um, how important are albums to, to you as a composer for the present and future of your shows? Well, I also want to say how uh, honored I am to be a part of this great panel with all my friends and, and talking about a subject matter that I love. Um, the the cast album is extremely important. I I, I look at it as... as uh, it's a number of things, but first thing that comes to mind, you, you want to capture the album in a listening experience. As Scott said, people walk out of the theater um, and hopefully they want to keep listening to what they heard inside. So you, there's a craft to it to figure out um, how you're both going to honor what's happening on stage, but also make it a listening experience. So there are a lot of decisions to be made about dialogue and, and there's you know, internal cuts that you might look at. You might want to put some bonus um, tracks on for, because shows, as we know, take a long time and there are a lot of songs that that come and go. Um, and so so you think about all of that, like when when people sit down and listen, what 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 is going to be um, the strongest version of a listening, listening experience? But also, um, if you're lucky, your show gets into the canon and there are going to be many people who are going to want to perform it uh, once it's out in the world. And so the album st stands as the documentation of that, of the score. So as the composer, you really want to be meticulous and take the time to um, to capture it in the best way you can. Uh, I like to really embrace it being an album because I grew up listening to albums. There are things you can do in the mix. There are things you can do um, when you're putting together the song form that that can be fun for the listening experience that's not meant for the show. Um, so I like to think about those things, but also um, for, for, the, for, a, for a future generation that's going to um, want to uh, perform, want to want to put up the show, the album will stand as something that they can reference. Yeah. And when you're in the studio, when you're producing as well as being the composer, how do you balance those two things? You see it as the same task or or different tasks? Well, I think the composer part of it is um, certainly just um, checking in with the work constantly and keeping track of performance um, and and working with everybody to, um, to try and make the best listening experience uh, and determine what's going to be on um, and what form it will take. Um, that also sort of, I think, drifts into the producer element. But producer, um, is 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 helping to determine schedule, helping to um, figure out you know uh, what what the sort of pacing is going to be, and then you also want to be in the studio talking about performance and um, what someone is when you hear uh, an actor performing on an album as opposed to seeing them. There's something that you can talk about uh, the. 
the performance might take on a different tone to put something across that you're not seeing. So, um, so I like to, as a producer, really take on the form of the album, help uh, put together the recording script, which really goes from song to song, what's going to have, what form it's going to take, what the dialogue will be, um, and then work with the engineer, work with other producers, work with your show producers who are presumably also going to be the album producers um, and just help manage every aspect of it and also keep a keep an eye on what the schedule is going to be post recording. Um, so so look at uh, comping, um, comping uh, instrumental tracks, comping vocal tracks um, and um, and making sure that you deliver um, at, at the most opportune moment for for the show. Yeah. I remember uh, I, I was fortunate to work with Steve Sondheim for a long time. And the first album I worked on with him, he said, never look at the singers while they're recording because you're going to be fooled by how charmed you are by their performance in the, on stage and how you know them and they're attractive people and you know all this stuff because the listener isn't going to have the benefit of that other than looking at a photograph. So it's, um, it's, it's tricky. Uh, but <laughs> and you also have to remember awesome. that, that there are some people who have done it and some people who haven't, um, yeah. you know, there, there are people, veterans who have done a lot of shows and they come in and they know the studio system. And as we were saying, um, you do this in a short amount of time. So I also like to just put everyone at ease and assure them that we are going to capture the best thing. And if, and, and if, if I tell them that we, we have it, then, then we have it. Yeah. So, uh, Kelly, you've made a lot of different albums, uh, new shows, revivals, uh, and uh, over the course of a while, what's the process like for you going into a recording session for a show? Is it high pressure? Is it nerve wracking? Is it, how do you, how do you manage that process? Well, it always feels a little, apropos of just what was just said, knowing that it's not part of a performance per se and the audience reaction. So you're the wonderful, I think the perfect world is when you make that album somewhere close to performance level. So you've now uh, the comments um, about doing it the day after we open or the day after the Tonys, I've been there several times because I'm also from back in the day. And um, I definitely had laryngitis after we opened South Pacific and came in the day of the recording and videoed myself uh, falsely making the album with all my cast and then came on a Thursday that week and re-recorded all my, you know, no one would ever know that. I had to re-record wow. the entire album, which was a, 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 to a, a great cost. I remember after Sweet Smell of Success, Brian Darcy James, same thing, very sick, had to record some things. Um, they had to technically changed something it was it was a big learning experience for me so on the in on the occasions that I've recorded albums when we feel pretty fresh and we just feel ready to do it but it's close to the performance um close to the dates whether it's just right after closing or sometime after a few weeks into after we open or something like that when we can prepare ourselves um all I know is as a singer which I think sets me apart here on the album as opposed to the the maker of the album is it seems to always run up against that. You know, when you make an album that is going to last forever, you you imagine it being the best version of the of the performance that you've given. And I will say I've never once felt that because we're doing it on a Monday with having just done eight shows going into eight more. You know, there's so many examples I can give you of, you know, should I take the show off on Sunday so that I could be fresh for Monday? And I've never done it, but my co-star did <laughs> that. I was mad, <laughs> you know, it was, yeah, it, it was one of those things. It's always, um, it's always a, a very stressful time because you just want to give it your all. You want it to be that thing that, as Tom says, sits as the mark, you know, for, for all the people who might sing it in the future. And we always sort of give our best at the moment, but never feel like it's the best um version that that happened you know um so you kind of let that go you can't really um you can't control it and i think probably the smartest thing and i can't believe i'm saying this out loud is that the actors don't get any control <laughs> it's probably smart <laughs> because we would want to come back and change and fix and and for that reason and no offense to the hard work that goes into making it i've never listened to any of my cast albums more than maybe once wow. i can't do it. okay yeah. I can't I can't do it psychologically. It doesn't ever match the way I felt in performance. Um, I don't think I've ever had an album feel like it was what I was feeling. 
So to listen to it for me um, makes me question what I felt in performance. And I think it's just because that will always be the case. What we feel inside is never sort of what is audible to others. That's how we share experience, right? It's just right. A, everyone, everyone takes and receives differently than you give. And um, so it's it's wonderful to hear that things are successful or, or beloved. And that's, you just got to leave it at that. Yeah. I, I worked with an actor once who had a lead role who had never made an album before and she wanted to listen back to every take. I was like, no, no, we have no time to do that. <laughs> um, just, just say that. There's no time. There's no time. There's no time. You can't. Uh, I'm just, yeah. And I know you You don't need my advice, but don't. Don't ever let them. Don't ever <laughs> let them. <laughs> yeah, no, well, and the, to your first point, though, you know, to for people who don't know, we we almost never record the album in show order. Um <laughs> Uh, in part because of trying uh, union costs and other things to try and get people into a, a particular time block. But also, you know, um, we're always cognizant of not wanting to make you do your seven big numbers all in a row, because that's going to be diminishing returns for anybody. Um, so that's hard. Yeah. Um, in terms of the, the process in the studio, do you find having the, the composer or the show director helpful there or is that a different kind of process for you? Oh, I think it's, um, first of all, I didn't say thank you for having me here. I'm, I'm very honored. Um, this has been a huge, uh, one of the biggest joys in my life is to have something forever because in theater, it's not always, at least not until more recently when things are filmed or people are filming, it. you didn't have any thing to hold on to for the rest of your life. And even if I don't listen that much, I know that it's there for my children and grandchildren and friends and family. Um, but I should say, I, I, I would never know how to record a cast album without the, the music maker in the room. Um, I, I don't, I would never want to do that because that there is a, they're the ones that sit and write this and have an idea about it in collaboration with your portrayal of it. But in that room of putting it down forever, whether it be, um, I mean, I know when we recorded Bridges of Madison County, there was a an acapella section that would not have happened without Jason conducting it from the booth, you know, probably watching a, a computer, you know, something to, to keep us on. Um, or, or just taking it again and saying, you know, I need to hear this more, I need to hear that less or, or whatever it is. And I, for me personally, this moment, my my part of it was in on stage, you know, in the performance of it. I feel like the recording is the composer's part. That's that's their, um, that's their forever, and that's that's the exactly what they want down forever. And I I would only want to do it with with their opinions, their uh, direction, you know, obviously collaboratively. And um, so I I don't. I've never done a cast album without the composer, unless it's um, <laughs> uh, Roger and Hammerstein yeah. who aren't around or someone like that. We have a seance. And, and, then, it's fine. and then you have someone. <laughs> and, but then you have people speaking on their behalves, and, and you also have to uh, take that advice too. Great. Um, Ian, as a, as a recording engineer, how do you prepare for this very intense short process in terms of layout and? technical aspects as well as uh, other things? Um, that's a, a great, great question. Um, cast album sessions are unlike any other recording session you will ever do. Um, they are faster than most sessions need to move. Uh, you have all, you know, there's really no room for downtime at all uh, because like everything is scheduled within an inch of its life. Um, and you have to prioritize the sound, the overall sonic picture of the album versus how much isolation and control you're gonna have in post. And it's always a balancing act because uh, especially with some of the classic shows, you really want it to feel like you're in the room with all the musicians and the actors and, and have that blend. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's stuff that's much more, you know, pop or modern day music these days where you want a ton of isolation. So it, it's always figuring out what contextually makes sense for the album and how you want to go about recording it. And then trying to get yourself the best uh, isolation uh, later as for post as possible. And the reason for that is there's just so little time to do the recording of it that, um, you know, you can take an incredible performance. And then if you have the isolation on it and have the ability to edit that later, you can go ahead, you can, you know, you can just fine tune that and sort of make it the best version that it's going to be of, of that of that recording. 
Um, so that's really a huge consideration of it. But the main thing when you're, when I sort of look at putting together a cast album setup is what's going to be most comfortable for the artists in the room doing the session. Um, you know, if the conduct, if these people are, if actors are used to having sightline with the conductor, how can we create a situation where they're going to have a similar sightline to that conductor or as close as we can get it to where they're comfortable in that room. If musicians are sitting a certain way in the pit, for example, like a horn section sits a certain way every time they do the show, trying to mimic that in the studio, you know, you try to take as many of the variables out of it as possible so that when people walk into the room, they're comfortable um, and that they can immediately sit down and start making music because that's the expectation. Um, you know, the other interesting thing with this is that it's very, um, you know, when you do a cast album with the band and, and the, with the orchestra and the vocalist at the same time, you're talking about uh, sessions where you probably have close to like 128 inputs at a time recording that. Uh, so you're dealing with uh, managing an enormous amount of microphones at one time. So when you look at setups like that, it's the priorities are really, how do we make the artists comfortable so they can hear and see each other as best as we can? And then secondly, what are the things I'm going to use technically that I know are going to work for 14 hours as we go through this day and not have any issues or, 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 or fail at any given time? And then second, then the third is like just thinking of what are the contingencies if those things do fail or we need to, to try something differently. Um, one thing that's... Um, made it much easier, I will say, is that video technology has improved immensely. So it's much easier to, to be able to isolate uh, singers and vocalists and, and musicians and be able to have uh, you know, as, as low latency as we can video between those places, which makes it really much easier to sort of space people out in spaces. And that's become a necessity as well because there's fewer and fewer sort of larger rooms to record in in, in New York City. Um, and then the second thing that's really, that I've noticed that's made a huge difference is that um, monitoring systems and headphone systems now that they have gone digital are so much more flexible and you can provide artists with much more control of what they're hearing which is really really for me has changed the game because when i first started you know you were doing everything on an analog console you were sending out you know headphone mixes off of the console usually and you were really boxed in as far as the flexibility of what you could give the artists um, and everybody was sharing mixes and everything. So it became this thing where it's it's always this compromise of what they're hearing in their headphones. Nowadays, um, we use uh, multi-channel like digital headphone mixers. And so you can create, um, you know, a much more flexible balance for for the for the uh, both the band and the singers as well, and that technology helps a lot. And what it really helps with is it just makes the process much faster because it's it's much less of a time frame between a singer showing up in the booth versus when they're comfortable versus like before it always sort of had to be a compromise of, oh, I can't give you more of yourself or less of yourself because this other vocalist is sharing your headphone mix. We try to avoid that now as much as possible, which just makes the process process faster. But really what it's about is, um, yeah, I, I go back to just like, what is the context of the recording of, of the album? What is the um, what is the most efficient way we can do this so that we never technically get in the way of the art that is happening? And then the final thing is just like, or probably the, the one of the most important is just making everybody comfortable in the room so that they can they can be their best and create. That's great. Yeah, I think it is, it, it's notable too that I think um, musical theater, jazz and classical are are kind of the only genres left where you're doing often everything at once, uh, as opposed to tracking. There are some albums where you've done that, um, track the band and then add a vocals later, but obviously there's, there you have to be very careful about click tracks or, or making sure that it's recorded in such a way that the singer is gonna feel comfortable with enough rubato and those, those places. Um, Tom, um, I'd also pipe in there, and Tom could probably speak to this a little bit too, and, and what Ian was talking about there is really that choice up front of, are we going to record everything live with musicians yeah. and vocalists at the same time, or are we going to do the backing tracks first and then do the vocalists at another point? And it was interesting when Tom and I were doing a couple of albums, um, the first one that we did live together was the Flying Over Sunset cast album um, from his show up at Lincoln Center. Um, and that was really necessity at the time. We were still kind of at the back end of COVID. Um, that was a crazy recording with every floor going at that, the power that, station. That was a crazy, yeah, that, that was uh, just for context. That was at the height of Omicron. So yes, we it were, was. Uh, I was managing the studio that that took place at at the time. And uh, we were basically just struggling to try to find staff that was still okay to do the session. That was, that was a wild, that, that was one of the most wild sessions I've, I've been a part of as far as logistics and getting it to the, through the finish line. Beyond. Um, yeah. So all three <laughs> floors going at the power station with vocalists up top. And then we had, you know, some musicians on one floor, some musicians in two other studios. 
But the thing that was interesting, even though that was out of necessity at the time and it was scary, um, was, you know, I think when we talked about it, uh, when we were done with the album, it was that we also noticed that it captured like a different kind of energy, um, a very special, specific kind of energy that can only happen when all those things are happening at one point in one building and all that frisson without that you could actually hear the crackle of it um, on the album. There was something very real and live and raw about it. And that actually informed um, our conversations when we did the Almost Famous cast album, which we originally thought we were going to do separate. But when we noticed that there really was a, an audible difference to that, we made that hard decision to do that for Almost Famous and we did everything live. But Tom, you may want to speak to that too, because these are the different ways we make albums. Yeah, and it's interesting that you that it, sometimes it seems that the project and the sensibility of what you've written dictates how best to record it, and hopefully you realize that before you go into the studio. Totally. Because, um, Flying over sunset uh, was was written um, that that the musical numbers in that mo a moment is almost stream of conscious. I mean, there are song identifications and songs begin and end, but once music starts, they kind of flow into one another. And it's a it's an album, actually, Scott. If you remember that, we embraced dialogue on because the dialogue was almost musical. The underscore yeah. dialogue were were songs of themselves, and the actors delivered their lines with such with that kind of heightened. Mm. Uh, uh, performance that singing uh, brings, so so it made sense in that regard. And then with with almost famous, you could, we could have done that to click and uh, you know in in a rock score, but but it felt like the energy the band was, uh, and, and the singers were in tandem on the energy of that um, uh, of that score. So so I'm I'm so happy that with both those shows we made that realization. Um, and I and then I look back at American Idiot, which. Um, Sean, what you were talking about before, that's actually one of those rare exceptions where we got to really take our time and we recorded the band in Berkeley um, uh, with Green Day. And then we we did the um, vocals in New York over the course of a week, I believe. So, um, you know, with ensemble vocals and then and then um, solos. So, um, it, you know, I've done it different ways. And, and it, it, you, I realized on that one what, what a luxury it is. Um, and not to say that Green Day money when you're going into that. <laughs> <laughs> but also not to say that that um, I, I fight for the two day uh, process, um, especially after an exhausting period like an opening or an awards show. Um, but but there is I do look back on some of those experiences as being the the the, the emotion of it and people sort of rising to the occasion, knowing that there's not as much time but 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 the the performances that have come out of those sessions on all on really all my cast albums has been enormously beautiful and and I don't look at any of those two day um uh time periods as being something that um, didn't capture anything but the essence and beauty of what I wanted to capture I I totally agree I mean it's like there's something magical about like everybody in the like what Scott was saying I'm just like everybody in the same room like playing together it's like there's you cannot recreate that it's it's really extraordinary and like you know when you hit that first downbeat and it's like you're doing a giant song with like 30 ensemble members and a bunch of cast and then you have like a you know a 14 or 16 piece orchestra playing along with that like the second that all that locks in together and like that energy like the cast sings differently the 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 band plays differently it's just so it's just a, such a beautiful thing to hear that all like gel together and it's you know you can try to recreate that magic but it's really not possible in a lot of scenarios so yeah i, I totally agree i was and, gonna yeah. oh go ahead no go ahead well, no, I just wanted to, even before this started, this particular subject, I was going to ask, I've always assumed it was financial because I've de definitely done cast albums where it was, we were completely separated. There was a lot of control. You could go back in and punch in. Everything was very made to perfection. And then I've done the ones where we were just all in the room and we're going to recreate the show in that moment with the musicians. And if it's not perfect, it's not perfect. And I tend to lean toward the fact that those are always the better ones. Mm -hmm. But it, which leads me to ask, as an art form, since we're here talking about cast albums as opposed to pop pop albums or music soundtracks, it leads me to ask, how do we keep the genre separate? Because, you know, on Broadway, people do sing live with no pro tools and no pitch correctors and no not over reverb or whatever it is. And as an art form, the musical theater, Broadway should have something about it that's different in those cast albums. And as we move toward more sounding more like actual, I mean, 
these days, especially with Tom Kitt scores and things like that. I mean, that's real. That is like Grammy winning pop stars, right? That's yeah. I'm, 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 I'm taking myself out of that. Right. But I'm talking about like the, the, Amer the world of rock and roll and pop as opposed to theater. Right. It's sounding that good where all of the people on Broadway right now, I mean, except for me, but could be like could be like Beyonce and stuff because that's but I'm saying, like, how do we separate the art form of Broadway and musical theater from you know, should it should it stay separate or should it all start to sound the same in that the recording sessions or it's captured live because the singers can actually sing live without any help. You yeah. Know, or, you know, not not any help, but you know what I'm saying? Like after a couple of takes, you can get a pretty good take. Yeah. No, it's a excuse me, it's a good point. <clears throat> when Ian and I were recording uh, Here We Are, the, the last Sondheim album that came out last month, uh, there was one particular part where David Hyde Pierce was um, having a little trouble with one note. And he said, you know, Sean, when Madonna sings flat, there's a machine that you can use. And I said, yeah, we have we have that machine too, but we'd rather try and get it right. And it turned out beautifully. Um, it's something Paul Gemignani said to me way back at the beginning of my career is that cast albums aren't supposed to sound perfect. And when you listen to those ones from even the, the ones we all love from the 50s and 60s, the, you know, the big classics, there are some really sour notes all over the place in those. And when you look at how they recorded them physically in the same room with no gobos and no isolation, really. I mean, usually the chorus was up, you know, upstage of the of the band and, and the old CBS studios. Um, so, you know, I think I think there is a. A, a hesitancy, at least on my part, on things that I'm producing to try and make it absolutely perfect. If there's something really off, you know, you know, the singers or the musicians not going to be happy if, you know, they're playing a quarter, singing a quarter tone flat either. So we can fix that. But um, there is a certain, even for instance, with Hamilton, where, you know, we recorded that over the course of like a month um, and different sections at different times. But um, it still sounds like a cast album. It has a little bit of a different sound because of what the show is, but um, I don't know. You know I you think the, the, the tricky thing is that we all are trying to capture an experience that we love to listen to in our head. It's so subjective. Right. The albums and music that I like to listen to and the things <clears throat> that make the hairs on my uh, my arms stand up, you know, could be completely different from what someone else feels. But that's what I'm leading with. And I remember on, on Almost Famous, there's a song called It's All Happening. And the other thing too about uh, performance in a theater versus a cast album is that there are so many things that sound design has to take into consideration. And often the, what the actors hear on stage is not representative of what the audience is hearing. They're getting a mix that's a certain thing. And, and, and in many cases, and Kelly, you can speak to this, certainly just being able to hear yourself and be able to exist in a place where you can make the sound you want to make. Um, and I remember the song, It's All Happening, which has a big sonic um, uh, uh, component to it, a lot of the actors came up to me and said, I had no idea it sounded this way. <laughs> and it was cool because for the album, I was able to deliver, like, this is what's been in my head the whole time. And whether yeah. you heard it on stage or in the audience, like now I get to kind of take the time and do that. That's where I like to lean into the cast recording. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but it's kind of cool that you can make a sonic listening experience that that matches what you set out to do in some way. I think the like the the editing part of it like the is is having to and I feel like I've made albums on all ends of that spectrum where it's like there's the ones that like were felt like that the contextually they needed to be more polished and more toward the pop side of of production and then ones that needed to feel freer and more open so it's really a sliding scale and you can do you can go anywhere within that within that sort of gradient um, and it really just depends on taste and context of, of what's trying to be delivered or what the vision is for it as well. But you you really, I mean, it's sort of like a doctor where it's like you try to do no harm, right? You, you try to do edits and stuff that still preserve the original performance and still preserve the what the what the intention was of that performance while still sort of making it, trying to make it the best, ver or not the best version, but a better version of itself. Yeah, which leads to Oscar and the, the special sauce of mastering and... The first time I worked with Oscar in, um, <clears throat> I think it was about seven years ago, and going in and hearing what his what his work brings to really enliven what we've all done up to that point. So, can you talk to a little bit about Oscar about what your process is and 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 uh, how you contribute to it? 
Uh, yes. First of all, thanks again for the invite of this great panel. Um, it's good to see everybody sort of in person, at least. <laughs> um, yeah, so my, my part is the mastering stage, which is the last stage. So we, we get all the pressure to deliver on time. Everything gets backed into us. And then we're the ones that the label is saying, where's the files? We need to deliver now. But we have to wait for the green light. So, um, John, I've never said that to you. I don't know what you're talking yeah, about. I don't know. Yeah, no, none of them. No, that's true. That's, that's just a myth. <laughs> um, so um, I like to divide the mastering side into two sections. The one is the artistic side, to sort of do it in the extra 10% polishing. The sequencing of the album is important. The spacing, especially for cast album, is, uh, is, is very important. So we do all that, where the ID starts, where it ends, the fade outs, you know, tops and tails, as, as we like to call them. And especially for cast albums, the, the spacing is important. Do we want it to be like it is on the show or is it more of, you know, the soundtrack of it where you get a little bit of space. Um, so all those things come into consideration. And the second part, which is even more important than that, the technical side is to create a viable master for duplication where it's going for CD, vinyl, streaming, all that stuff. And we do the final quality quality check to make sure there's no clicks, pops, everything is sounding where it should be um, and all that good stuff. So that's essentially in a nutshell what the mastering stage is. Do you approach that differently for cast albums than you do for other things? Because I know you you master things for all sorts of other genres. Um, not really. We just uh, I think it's just genre specific. In this case, you definitely want to make sure that the vocals are heard, it's telling the story, but it's also the arrangement and the music is is part of it as well. Um, so I think the big difference with other genres is is the sequencing is is very important, and that's the one thing that we really try to focus on. Um, I really try to work a lot with the producers and the mixing engineers. And I'm fortunate to have, you know, a good relationship with everybody. And um, with the mixing engineers, sometimes because the pace is so fast, they start feeding me rough mixes or close mixes to final. So, you know, we can start saying, oh, yes, this sounds right. Or can you try this? And we start getting an idea of what sound everybody's looking for. Because again, we don't have much time in that process of mastering to really uh, master it and I really like to have everybody at least give it one or two listens over before sending it out even if we deliver late um, this is it so we try I try to be involved as early as possible um, and so it's part of the team yeah yeah I think it is interesting because most people don't think about the, the track gaps or other things where the pacing of <clears throat> those things like um the, the connector, which we just did, has no gaps. Almost. And, no gaps. But other things there are, you know, and it's really, it's sort of by feel. Um, your feel and producer's feel and the composer's feel um, and how that's delivered. Because obviously, even though it's in show order, it's, there are things that are missing that aren't, that are in the show, but not on the record. Correct. Yes. And Great. a lot of times it's even, the idea was to sequence it in a way where, the tracks will feed into each other, but you don't think about what happens if somebody starts to track. You're going to hear a little bit of the tail from before. So that's something we always have to bring up and say, are you okay with that? You know, it's supposed to be continuous. And then that's the whole discussion as well as, well, maybe we won't have it because I don't like that or it right. should be like that. So, yeah. Yeah. The, well, there is a big difference, especially with streaming services and listening to a whole album all the way through or just starting and listening yeah. to a track. Yeah. Um, what about Dolby Atmos or spatial audio? Uh, I know you've been doing some things in there and how do you think that affects the, the cast album process or there? Um, yes, we have, I have been doing quite a bit of it. Um, the genre itself, I mean, the, the, the format itself, I really like, I drank the Kool-Aid, so I'm a big fan of it. Uh, um, engineering wise, it's great. Um, it's just, it's just an extra process. It's, it's really nice. Um, now the mastering side is the way it stands right now, it's way more technical side than the artistic side. We try to match it to what the stereo is, but the technical side and the deliver deliverables are, are, are what sets it apart. Um, so we spend a lot of time doing that, making sure we hit all the specs and it, it does match uh, what the stereo is. So um, we just have to add at least an extra three or four days to the process, which sometimes is it's hard, but um, it's, it's yeah. yeah. If we know in advance, we will make it work. <laughs> John, I would like, I mean, I'd say also though, with um, the spatial audio, 
um, we've only done a handful of those or, or more than a handful of cast albums because I actually do think there is a difference and it's not just the technical, but because um, I know we were do we did a whole bunch of the classic Sondheims that we were able to go back um, and put into spatial audio. And when we had people that were starting to work on them that didn't really do cast albums as their main you know thing, we kept getting mixes back and I was like, this is wrong this doesn't work, this doesn't work. And they kept saying, well, what, what doesn't work about it? And I said, there's something different because this actually has a dramatic intention to it. And it was the first one that we did was company. And I kept saying, I was like, you don't realize this one voice, this one character is actually the center of everything. So you need to actually devise, how can you do a mix where this person is in the middle and everything happens all around them? Right. I was like, but they could, still couldn't. And so I actually had to hire separate people from the musical theater world to advise, to say, hey, this, this is different. This isn't yeah. just, oh, that drums sound cool over there and those horns sound good over here. I'm like, you're actually now telling a story with music. And so this actually needs to be conceived differently. So I've actually found that to be really interesting with spatial audio and cast albums. And if anything, maybe that might be the coolest thing for a cast album is to be able to make it in spatial and to give you an experience that's closer to being live, like in a theater. Yeah, no, right. I think that I think that's right because when you're when you when you're doing that, it to me at least from my approach, it should feel like almost like you're sitting on stage with the actors and everything. The sound is happening around you. Um, but of course, in order to enjoy this, you do have to have the right equipment to listen to it on, uh, which most people would be headphones, and that can be a mixed bag. But when it's when you're sitting in that room with all that speak that speaker array around you, it sounds pretty cool. But even even it's it's more the 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 spatial audio I think for cast albums is a little bit more like the classical music what we do, which is you yeah. want to feel the orchestra around you or more of the room. Just that idea it helps tell the story more. Um, and if it's done right, even on headphones, you will get a little bit more of that and that space. It's not the speakers, but if it's done right, you do get to feel that, which is which is nice. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so we should probably take some questions. Um, I'm looking up the chat here. Uh, Michael asked if uh, we use the show band orchestra, uh, which we do. Um, and or is it changed for the recording? Um, every once in a while, we'll add a few instruments. It's not as often as it used to be. Um, I remember when I was music directing uh, Sondheim's Passion 20 years ago, and somebody in the director said, well, I listened to the record and the strings were so much louder there. I said, yeah, because they added 16 players. You could do that in 1994. Um, now it's, it's less often, but it usually is the show arrangement. You, like Tom said, you know, you make decisions about what you're going to include and what you're not, but aren't a huge amount of, uh, of different things there. But I must, I must give a shout out to Scott Farthing, who I've done, uh, I think now three albums. Um, we, we had more, way more than that, buddy. <laughs> no, no. I mean that we've expanded. Yes. That's true. If, if then, and, um, almost famous, um, and flying over sunset. Of course, Michael Starabin <laughs> did it then, and flying over sunset brought that to the table and said, "I would like to expand the strings." But it was it was very nice to have. Um, and and again, that's where you can lean into the listening experience a little bit and say, if you have a few more strings, um, you can go from four to to eighteen or twelve or whatever it might be. It it does make a difference. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, streaming economics and how this affects. Uh, uh, income and royalties. Um, Scott, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> mm, fun. <laughs> the fun part. Um, look, I mean, how about I take the positive aspect to this, which is what streaming has done is enable everyone around the globe access to this music. And let's really talk about it. You kind of teed it up at the beginning. We're talking Broadway is literally 15 blocks in one city on this entire planet. So what streaming has done um, is open, you know, given access to everybody around the world that has an internet connection to all the, you know, the greatest music ever made. All music ever made is literally in your phone these days. Um, yeah, streaming does, we don't make as much money per stream as we would if we sold a CD or an LP or something that was a physical in nature. Um, 
but you also can't see these kind of numbers, you know, yeah, maybe did I listen to um, Avita vinyl when I was 10 years old, a billion times over till it was scratched and God knows how many times I played that? Yes. But I also know that, you know, when you're looking at numbers, like say I was looking last week at SpongeBob, that thing's been streamed 90 million times. That's a lot of people have gotten to listen to that music that would never in another era had access to that. So that's exciting to know that these artists work, your Tom Kitts, your Kelly O'Hara's, these people that your music really does now affect a global populace or that they have access to that is pretty awesome just to think of that and to know these things really hopefully as long as music is around will live forever. And that is also pretty awesome. Yeah, that's true. And, and the number of places where you can find physical media for cast albums is significantly smaller than it used to be. Obviously there's things like Amazon, but you know, most of the major um, retailers don't carry no. that anymore. Best Buy doesn't, um, most of the others no. don't. So, but it's interesting for this particular genre, which is also different than probably any other genre. Another thing that's different is that there still are though, People oh, yeah. who listen to cast albums, they actually still, a lot of them prefer a physical copy. They want to have that experience because I think one of the cool things and one of the reasons I loved, um, loved them growing up and I still love them is that it's different than other listeners because you actually engage with the music differently. And especially if you've not been able to see a show, you're actually in the process when you're listening to it and you're creating that show in your head or your version of what that show is. And part of that experience is holding that physical thing in front of you, seeing the photos of the production that maybe you didn't get to see, of following along the lyrics, of understanding what the story is. So it's, a, it's actually a really amazing storytelling art form via music that people actually engage with and, and make something themselves out of it, 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 which is its own weird, tiny little thing of like what is special about theater where it's yeah. different because the audience is bringing an energy to it that, you know, co coalesces with what's happening on stage and it's something different every time. And, and that's also what we're trying to actually do to take right. it back to the beginning of with a cast album is I want to be able to deliver that experience yeah. to a listener that they get that engaged, that they're able to literally make this musical in their head or their own version of that. Cause that's yeah. what I enjoy. And I want to give that to other people as well. When having that, the, the packaging is much more important. Uh, you know, we, we do digital booklets for everything that we do that we have for free on our website because some things are streaming only and some are not. Um, but yeah, you can see from, this is not a virtual background. There are 2000 <laughs> CDs in the case behind me. Um, and, uh, and they do still sell uh, CDs and, and vinyl too. Um, there's a stat in Billboard last year where they estimated, I'm not sure how they came to this, that 50% of the people who buy vinyl do not own a turntable, um, but they just want a physical thing to hold in their hand. Um, and it's beautiful packaging and all that. So you never know until they figure out you have to flip it over every five seconds. <laughs> it's also the, 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 the order, the sequencing um, as a composer, um, again, someone who grew up on albums, the, the idea that I get to, pick the order of the songs and, and it's meant art to artistically for you to discover it in that way. You can listen to it out of order, but having the physical representation. And we also, I mean, we're, we're an art form that, that gives you playbills and, and you keep ticket stubs. And so all of the physical things that come with the show, the memorabilia is important, even just the, the, the artwork and the way that the title of the show is set. So all of those yeah. things, um, you know, I don't want to stare at a playlist on a computer. I want to stare at a physical representation that brings about all of that nostalgia from remembering when I discovered the show in the theater. Yeah, I remember Lloyd Richards used to say at the O'Neill that a playwright is somebody who, who taps you on the shoulder and says, come to this building at eight o'clock and sit in silence with hundreds of strangers, because what I have to say is more important than what you'd be doing otherwise. And um and so I think the the physical act of listening to an album like that all the way through is is part of that too. Um, Kelly, there's a question here about recording the Brigadoon cast album since it was such, such a long gap between performances and recording. Yeah, um, the question just okay. I don't see it, but it, that that is true. <laughs> it was almost I think a year. Um, but it was one of those experiences where uh, it was in the room all together. We did it very quickly at uh, Brishnikov, you know, in the one of those big rooms, which you said they're, the, the bigger rooms are disappearing. Um, I guess I've done a few there now. Uh, 
but it it was strange because I was trying to uh, rethink it several uh, weeks before we knew we were going to record. Try to put myself back on the stage um, to remember sort of what what happened. But I remember it being a very joyous day, um, just to get to reconvene. Um, and and of course that music is something that you. Uh, it wasn't brand new music. It's a revival of something. So we were able to come in and uh, more easily, I think, all shift and get together. But uh, one one of the things I was going to say about being in those rooms too, apropos of what I was saying about a singer hearing something different than the composer hears from out here, is that one of the great things about those days in the recording studio and then what, what it produces is we don't in the mix on a Broadway stage always get to hear every orchestration, like every every little quote, every little instrumentation. While we're singing at the top of our voice, something doing something so beautifully to support us or to harmonize with us. And um, I think when you when you get into a room like that and face each other and then also listen afterwards, it's sort of you're learning a brand new experience uh, too. Um, so it's it's all pretty cool. Um, as far as the Brigadoon thing, I, that that was one of the weirder things to kind of revisit something after a year and not have that that immediacy, but it still was a, a wonderful thing to get to do. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I think, and it, you know, and then sometimes we do these things with, with, particularly with revival albums, where you do an entirely studio cast, where it's you know people who've never performed the show, or maybe if they did a production, it was a long time ago, and assembling people to do that or concerts where you do these things. And, um, and that's tricky because you, you as a performer wouldn't necessarily have, you have very limited rehearsal and then you're expected to deliver something different. Yeah, we didn't rehearse at all. We just came on the day. and <laughs> But, you know, you see your old friend and you start, you know, you laugh and you get into it and the musicians <clears throat> of course, are always spot on. So, um, but there's nothing against the end. There's nothing to compare to the energy of trying to capture that album right off of or right in the middle of that adrenaline that is actually happening at night in the show. So as much as we're tired, I wouldn't want to do it that way every time. I wouldn't want to wait six months or a year. I'd want to do it right there in the height of it, knowing what we actually are feeling and, and recreating that and hopefully having that captured. Because that that is what sets us apart. That's the live nature of it. and. Um, and I think that's what makes the, the recordings different, you know, because we're yeah. actually, you know. well, You're doing it live first and then making a record as opposed to doing a record and then touring with the songs from the record. Yeah, and, and, <clears throat> and to, to, to record something early, like we would just recorded Days of Wine and Roses after the Atlantic run, but then change things for the Broadway run. And that feels sometimes strange because now I wish we could go back and record the things that we changed. Um, but it's okay. I mean, it's all a version. That was the Atlantic theater album, right? So that yeah. there's versions of things that change, but. We had a similar thing with SpongeBob where we recorded it right after Chicago and we made a, a, a number of changes. I, I, I similarly want to go back and re-record <laughs> that stuff, but I'm, I would imagine Scott, and you can speak to this, that there are the, um, you know, you're thinking about promotional um, opportunities and you want to get the music out there as soon as possible and be able well, to. Bring yeah. I would say, look, we, I've maybe learned, we've evolved over time and um, it is, there are advantages to recording early, but um, you speak to the disadvantage there. So what I usually try to do now is like, hey, can we do one early session where we maybe do three songs that you know are likely not going to change and then we'll hold the rest for actual later. So it still gives them the show some marketing materials and we get some of that music out there early. Um, but we leave the rest till later. And so that's that's kind of the modern day new version of that. So if we did SpongeBob now, we'd probably do that. <laughs> well, and, and also, you know, to sort of tie this in, <clears throat> making, because there are so many, the, the market for CDs is so much smaller in general than it used to be. It takes a lot longer to make them because of the booklet and the duplication and there aren't that many plants anymore. Uh, vinyl takes a long time because of the physical making of the thing, although it's faster than it was a couple of years ago. Um, but for I sometimes see uh, people online say, well, why is it out on streaming? But the CD and the vinyl is months later. It's like, that's what it is. And we want to get it out there as fast as possible. Um, so, yeah. 